um, you can you can feel free to go there if, if that happens for some reason. Okay, I'll look for a final thumbs up from the speakers and Linda. If I get all the thumbs up I need, we can kick it off. Linda, take it away. Cool, thanks. Thanks everyone for attending this second Ethereum Dev onboarding session. Uh, we had a great one a couple months ago, so we figured we'd continue it. Um, this session is gonna be recorded, so you can refer to it later. And also please feel free to share it with others that you think it'd be useful for. Um, the reason we put this together is we feel like uh, it can be really overwhelming sometimes uh, coming into the Ethereum ecosystem and um, not really knowing like which tools and resources to use. Also the space changes really quickly. So we kind of want to be like some friendly faces and we have brought on some like really amazing devs today to talk about what tools and resources they use, give some advice and do some Q and A. So really excited about today. Um, the structure is just going to be, uh, we're going to have Austin just give a high level overview. We're going to do some dev intros and then we'll have the speaker shoulder stack. Um, and then we'll feel free to put some questions in the chat if you have questions. Otherwise, we're going to bring up some pre-submitted questions. And then uh, just huge shout out to Trent for organizing this. He's been doing so much work behind the scenes, making sure everything works properly. So thank you, Trent, for all that. So um, I'm just going to have Austin kick it off. Thanks for having me. Happy Bowtie Friday, everybody. Uh, I think that actually I'm gonna call an audible and kind of do the dev intros and the intro to tooling all, all in one. And we'll just dive right into to Rickmu after this. So uh, I think we're at this, and I keep saying this, there's this inflection point, I think, with tooling in the Ethereum space where uh, some of the original tools kind of got the job done, but they were kind of hard to use or didn't make sense to a new person. And, and there are, uh, you'll notice some tools that we present today, there actually existed an, a, a tool to do somewhat similar things before, but it only really got like 70% of the way. And for someone to take on the challenge of basically having to start from zero, but get it more to like 90, 90 or 95% is, is a heck of an undertaking. And, and these guys that are on this call today, guys and gals, uh, they, they deserve uh, basically a lot of credit for pushing it that extra distance. And it, and it's for you guys, it's for us, it's for the builders to be able to take those tools, pick them up and run with them and, and actually have a great experience. The space is already so complicated that if you're dealing with headaches with your tools, it's, it just makes it just such such a hill to climb. And, and so a huge thanks to the guys and girls here that are helping out and a huge thanks to uh, Trent and Linda for, for having us, giving us this platform. I think that one one thing that that I would dig into to start with is sort of these are these are pretty opinionated stacks. These are these are stacks from builders that have been building tools themselves, and and they found themselves spinning their wheels or having problems with things, and they said no, we're going to do it this way, and this is how it's going to go. And I I think starting with Rick Moo, that's a that's a great 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 way to kick kick him into it. But I think that like we we have to as builders as tool builders sort of think about the builder and and have them in mind and and also uh i think that it's 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 easy to to only go the 70 percent. and I, I really want to stress the fact that these guys that that took it to 90 percent really uh have created some great tools for you and they're going to present them today and i'm really excited about this uh, uh another thing that i kind of want to dive into a, a little bit is sort of the uh the, the getting started, like, don't be afraid to dive in and get started. And these tools will help you today. There, there's this, it seems daunting when you start to get into it. But really, what we're going to find today is it's, it's actually really, really easy to build a decentralized application. It's really, really hard to build a good, secure decentralized application. But we want to give you the confidence and the groundwork to be able to just dive in and start building. And that's kind of what this is all about. It's about what are the tools in the space? How, how, are, how are they the best tools to be using? And, and how do I dive in and, and get started with those? Uh, one, one last thing I will say is that you, you might think you know everything also. There's this, there's this version of myself a couple of years ago and I was building a decentralized Oracle protocol and I was gonna get rich and I was gonna write a white paper and I was gonna kick everyone's ass and it just doesn't work that way. Like the, the space is incredibly complicated and you have to understand that you don't know everything 
And, and uh, these guys and gals are here to help you kind of get over that hump, both, both, both get up the hump, but also get down and understand that, that it, there is like some serious complexity here, but these tools are going to make it a lot easier for you. Okay, I think that that is uh, my my shield for for being careful about what you know and what you don't know. Uh, these these presenters today, we've got Rick Mu, who created Ethers.js. Web3.js did exist, might be easier, I don't know, but he recreated it, and there's a reason why, and you'll see when we get into that. And Ethers kind of He'll take you through providers, wallets, uh, the utilities that come with that, how you interact with a contract. It's kind of like a low-level scripting language, right? Probably zero dependencies. He probably rewrote all of them. We'll see. <laughs> Two, uh, <laughs> okay. Then we have Patri Patricio with Hard Hat. Again, Truffle existed, but they rewrote, they they built a new tool, this compiler, this this task runner, and it's very extensible. And, and it gives you a ton of EVM introspection and he'll dive into that and why it's so important. And then we have kind of, then, then it kind of transitions to the DAP building templates, uh, starting with Ronan, with, with Jolly Roger and also his hard hat deploy. It's kind of an extension of hard hat and it, and it builds a lot of extra things and it shows how hard hat can be built upon as, as you know, we can add more tooling to that. And also Svelte, we will see Svelte come in here. I think most of, most of the guys on the call are React heavy, but it's good to, you know, whoever Svelte it, dealt it. And that'll, that'll be Ronan. So then uh, Robin, this is a fun one. So Robin created, Robin and his partner created a, a kind of a React hook generator library for ETH Global for the hackathon. So that shows that like some of these, there's, there's a lot of room for more tools to come in here and, and, and new players to come in. And he's, I think you're funded by the Norwegian government to create open source tooling around Ethereum, which is like so exciting for us that we, we get like the Norwegian government helping us build tools. And then our tools can, can also kind of help you build, build your thing. And then we have Paul Berg with Create ETH app. I think the name says it all, right? I think we were all thinking it would be great to have a Create ETH app. He, he's done a great job of taking Create React app and plugging in all those artifacts that you have from existing like the die contract and Ave and all these protocols that are that are super advanced, he's plugged those artifacts in for you. So you can do, I want to create ETHAP, I want to bring in Ave, I want to uh, create, you know, something within React. And if, when you get in there, it's really fun. And, and this kind of plays to this de developer experience thing. He's commented things out and he's hid things within the React. And as you start building, you uncomment it and you have these magic moments of, oh, I get how this works and I get these tooling. So excited to see Paul uh, present that. And then I'll do my spiel on Scaffold ETH and kind of give, give my hackathon stack uh, also, but really excited to have these folks here and get right into it. I think we should just start with Rickmu. Rickmu, if you're ready, uh, let's, let's, let's kick it off with ethers.js. Well, cool. Hi, hi. Um, as a quick note, the slides were very last minute. So I was just, oh, I should be able to share my screen. So I was pointed. I should probably point out the features of Ethers.js overall. Um, let's see if this works. It's a new laptop, so I'm still experimenting with sharing. Can people see my screen? Awesome. Uh, so basically, here's the quick over. This is just from the docs. By the way, I think it's one of the biggest features of Ethers is it has fairly substantial documentation. Um, so some of the quick features um, I just like to point out. So first of all, like like Austin said, very light on dependencies. All dependencies are MIT licensed. So uh, there's no worries about, oh, some random library along the line is being pulled in and now your stuff gets like GPL'd or whatever. Um, documentation, it's complete, it's tiny, it's a bit bigger than this now, but still about the same. Um, it's also modular. Um, anyways, I think I'll just move on to the actual slides. Like I said, the slides are kind of last minute. Um, oh, by the way, I'm Richard. Um, I think Austin introduced me and all that good stuff already. So... Share screen, keynote. Um, can the slides be seen? Yep, we got it. Now, once I click play, let me know if they stop working. Does nope, that still work? Good. Awesome, perfect. Um, so Ethers.js, um, what is it? So it's really a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I was trying to go for the whole, like, here's all the things it is, but I didn't have a chance to list everything or figure out what else to include here. Um, so by highlighted the things I was going to show off today, um, I'm not quite sure what the target audience is really, but hopefully this isn't too deep or too shallow. Um, but again, there'll be questions at the end, so feel free to ask. So, oh, how do I make it go to the next? There we go. 
Um, so one of the biggest issues people have with ethers when they first come to it from something like Web3 is that providers and signers are very, very different things. Um, people are used to Web3 world where a provider is literally everything. It has your private keys sitting in there. It has the ability to look up the block number. Um, it can sign transactions, send transactions. So in ethers, those are very separate things. There's a provider, which is read only. Oh, by the way, can you see my mouse? If I wiggle my mouse. So it's kind of like me pointing. No. I okay. Don't think so. Uh, so there's no way for me to really point, but I'm pointing at the under providers section. Um, so the read only access, there's no account access and some signers can return a, or sorry, some providers can, can return a signer, um, which do have an address. They can sign transactions. They can send transactions. They can sign type data. They do, they do all those things that, that you're used to doing with an account. Um, but yes, the abstraction is very, very harsh in ethers. And going back to what Austin was talking about with the, the opinionated thing, um, like in the future, I expect this to be the case. I do not want people having their, their massive uh, connected all the time to the internet geth node holding all their private keys, just exposing them to the internet if there's like some bug in the gossip protocols or whatever. Um, so really, I mean, I just want to go over quickly because everyone complains about that when they first start. They stop complaining soon thereafter. I'm not just because they get used to it or because like they start accepting us the way it should be or whether they just realize that I'm quite not budgeable on this aspect. So um, anyways, people stop complaining. So there's something there maybe, hopefully. Um, so onto a wallet. A wallet is the simplest signer you can really have. Basically, it's just a private key. It sits there. Um, so this is an instance of a signer. Signer is kind of like a interface that things, things adhere to. Um, so you just create a, you can create a wallet, pass in your private key, optionally provide it a provider. Um, if you give it a provider, then you can do things like send transaction. Um, if you don't give it a provider, it can still sign messages. It can still sign transactions, sign all those fun things you want to do, calculate the address. Um, it just doesn't have a connection to the actual um, blockchain. And you can imagine this is why you want the difference between a signer and a provider because there are times where you have a computer that's like I have a Chromebook. I've removed the the antennas and all the pieces of circuitry that I could that without damaging the computer um, that actually connect to the internet. So it completely signs everything offline. It has no way to even talk to the outside world. The Bluetooth antenna has been clipped. Um, actually, I think I've removed the entire chip, possibly through solder, a few things that weren't essential. Um, but anyways, the important thing is that computer is completely offline, but it can still sign transactions and they show up on the screen like a QR code. And so I can make sure that there's no one hacking or stealing information or looking at the private key on the computer. So, I mean, in that case, the wallet is completely disconnected. And then you can use something like this, um, actually, probably then, yeah. Anyways, that's long story short. I've got five minutes, I think. I don't know how I'm doing. So I'm going to kind of go through these quicker. Um, so JSON RPC signer, this is what people are thinking of usually when they think of a provider. Um, it can, it, this is like a geth node. And so if you are running your own geth node, for example, you can get a signer out of it. Again, I'm moving the mouse around, you're not seeing it. Um, so you can get a signer out of it, then you can do all the things you're used to doing with it. Um, but you don't, for example, if you connect to Infira, it's still a JSON RPC signer, sorry, RPC signer. Let me, did I already do? Anyways, I'm going to move on because it looks like I maybe missed a slide, but anyways. Um, so yeah, this is more what people are used to when they're thinking of Web3 world as a JSON RPC provider with a JSON RPC signer. Um, the nice thing is when you move away from that idea, you can have a provider that's Etherscan and you can have a signer that's a hardware wallet. Um, you can kind of decouple those two things so you can keep your, your private keys somewhere safe or just have no private key and, and still behave like you have a, a signer-like object. Um, the default provider is kind of the thing I kind of really want to dive into. I think this is one of the things that makes Ethers the most useful. Um, basically, it's get connected, do what you want to do now. There's no need to install Geth, sync a node, install MetaMask, or all those things. A lot of things you want to do are simply, I just want to read the blockchain. Uh, so a default provider, the way it works is it connects to multiple backends, third-party backends like Infira, Alchemy, Cloudflare, uh, Pockets coming soon, Etherscan. So it connects to all those backends. And whenever you query it, whenever you ask for the current block number, it'll actually pick at random two of those backends and ask them. 
if they agree, you get that response back. If they disagree, it's going to pick a third one randomly and it's going to keep going until there is a, 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 a consensus, until somebody's, until two of these things have agreed. And the idea is hopefully, as long as you can trust two of Etherscan and Fear, Alchemy, Cloudflare, um, that you'll get back honest answers. It protects you from things being out of sync, for example. When Inferior went down, uh, one of the things I wanted to point out that came to my mind yesterday, anyone who was using the, the default provider did not notice Inferior's outage. It just kept on trucking um, because Inferior may have been out of sync, but whenever Etherscan was asked and Inferior was asked, their answers would have been different. And so it probably would have moved on to asking Alchemy and Alchemy would have given the same answer that Etherscan did. And so now you can start trucking forward and Inferior being down simply didn't affect anything. Um, so let's see, contracts. Uh, one other thing I want to point out about ethers that I think was unique at the time, I think it's becoming more common now, is that ENS is a first class citizen. Anywhere you can use an address, you can use an ENS name. So I use this all the time. So for example, if you use the Takoyaki registrar, which we released for ETH New York, it's living at takoyaki.eth. When we update that, because it still has not been updated for um, the, the ENS change they made a while back, it's been a while, but once we do update it, we're just gonna change the Takoyaki's um, uh, ENS name and all the existing dApps will just continue on working. There'll be nothing to see. There's no addresses to go around the world and like change because you know we made a mistake or some of our dependencies made a mistake or whatever. We just need to change the, the takoyaki.eth where it points to that address and it keeps on going. Um, otherwise, is it, a lot of these things are designed more for frameworks, so frameworks can use them more easily. I don't know if there's anything else on the slide people want to ask questions about, feel free to. There's events, uh, so you can create filters, you can listen to events, and it'll parse all the arguments out for you. Uh, one other quick note is anywhere that takes a block tag can also take in a negative number. For example, you hear, see here the query filter uh, takes in negative 100 to latest. That's simply saying within the last 100 blocks. Um, it, it was not keeping track of time, so I'm almost done though. Uh, human readable ABI is this kind of another big point I want to uh, bring up is a lot of dApps today, when they have their their um, ABI, it's some massive JSON file sitting off on their disk somewhere. And then when it's time to debug, you never, you have to, if you don't know the code, you have to go looking up through the JSON, what parameters does get value take or that sort of thing. Uh, human readable ABI are meant to be like inlined right into your code. So you kind of know what's going on with that specific object you have. Um, Basically, it's readable. You can look at this and know exactly what functions will exist on this meta class. Uh, and one other quick note is this at 5,000 you see next to set value. You can set a recommended gas limit. Uh, so if you use, for example, Viper, Viper knows exactly how much gas a given function is going to take and will actually bake it in for you. Uh, if you know the amount of gas, this will save you that estimate gas call, that round trip, at, and improve your performance. And just be a better UX in general. Uh, it still works obviously with old school AB, uh, JSON ABIs. And that's all I've got. Uh, questions, if questions, it sounds like maybe questions are going to the end. Um, I will let Austin or whoever is the MC. So, Rick, oh, we had ahead. one question um, in chat from Garrett. Uh, can you use default providers for test nets? Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, one difference is if you use it on a test net is it doesn't use a quorum of two. It just uses a quorum of one because it's a test net and it's not as critical. If you want, you can pass it for the default provider. It takes in a bunch of optional options. If you want a test net that has a higher quorum, you can dial that up as well. Cool. Thank you. One, one question that I'd like to ask or, or even add to this is like, what's a, what's the good quest, a good uh, ethers quest? Is it maybe building a script that creates a wallet that sends some funds, like maybe shows the balance and sends some funds? Let's, let's maybe come up with a good little side quest of here, here's the best way to get started with ethers. Yeah, I mean, that's a great option. Uh, what I would recommend, actually maybe the easiest thing to do is if you install the ethers CLI, uh, so like npm install at ethers project slash CLI. Um, I'm not sure if people are probably used to REPL, like the, I don't know what it stands for anymore, but basically it's a, you know, it's like a command line where you get to just type in JavaScript commands. Um, if 
you install that, you can just literally type that and then you can do all the things you're talking about, but just at the command line, you can experiment. You can see what happens if I do this. Um, but if you were looking for like a small, concise little project, just to like whet your appetite, one thing that might be useful is a sweep script. Um, oftentimes people publish their private key by accident. You want a one line command that you hit and it will connect to that private key, uh, grab, create the transaction that takes all the money, less the gas fee, less the fee, and send it to your address. Um, I mean, the same script is also useful by attackers when they see a private key and they want to steal the funds as quick as possible. But I usually like to focus on the, 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 the happy side, which is you've just posted your mnemonic by accident to GitHub, and you've got about 15 seconds before some bot notices and steals it. It'd be nice if you have that script ready to go that you can hopefully get it typed into your command line within the 10 seconds. Um, as a, as a for, quick, like, yeah. For each exclamation point you add to the end of the command, it, it doubles the gas. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, that's the other thing, right? For a sweep script, you probably want to, for example, take a look at the current gas price and literally double it because you're going to lose everything soon. Maybe you don't mind spending the $20 to save that one ether. Um, Long story short, don't publish private keys. It. It, well, yeah. exactly. The, the attacker is going to spend, he, he'll spend the whole thing up to about a dollar. He'll, uh, he or she, uh, but yes, they'll spend everything right up to the, they'll, they'll, they're just happy to break even. They will bury you for that. Uh, so we have one more question. Uh, after sending the transaction, does Ethers keep pulling the RPC nodes for transaction confirmation automatically every second? Only if you ask it for. And so every second, um, it'll pull. So the way polling works in Ethers, um, so if you're using a web socket provider, obviously there's no polling, but in the case of a polling provider, which are actually most of them, uh, what it does is it pulls every six seconds for whether the block number has changed. If the block number has changed, then it worries about processing other events. But if the block number has changed, because block number is generally a much cheaper call to do. Um, so once you send a transaction, you get back the transaction object. It does no po polling after that. If you do, uh, I lost my slides, but if you do a, a wait on that transaction object, that's when it's doing that polling, looking for confirmations. And you can also specify how many confirmations you want. By default, it's one. And so if you do like a transaction dot wait, like an A wait transaction dot wait, it'll wait until there's one confirmation, but you could do wait two if you wanted to make sure there's two confirmations. Or if you wanted a non-blocking wait, you could wait for zero. Um, and that will return the transaction receipt if it's been, been mined and just move right on forward if it's not been mined and return null. So you get blocking or non-blocking polling if you want it. Awesome, thank you. So I think uh, we can move to hard hat now. Awesome, thanks everyone. Let me set up. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm Patricio uh, and I'm just gonna do a quick intro of Hardhat. First, talking a bit about what Hardhat is and then just a small demo of how a Hardhat project looks like and how you interact with it. Uh, so for people who are new to Ethereum development, Hardhat, uh, it's probably better to explain uh, with an analogy from other stacks. Like if you're a web developer, uh, Hardhat takes the role or kind of takes the role of webpack or parcel during web development. Or if you're an Android developer or Java developer, uh, it, you can look at it as if it were Gradle. Th there are other tools for other stacks, but there's always like a central tool which automates your workflow and lets you run things. And that's uh, what Hardhat does. So the features uh, it has uh, are well, quite a few. Hardhat is very flexible. As uh, Austin mentioned, uh, before Hardhat, and it's still running, there was a Truffle, which is like an alternative. Uh, and the main difference between Hardhat and Truffle is that Hardhat is designed to be flexible. So you can connect almost every tool on the Ethereum ecosystem uh, to Hardhat and just use it. Uh, like for example, you could use Web3 or you could use Ethers. Uh, it depends on you. The hardhat doesn't force you uh, like a, a choice. Uh, 
Uh, also, Carhat is used to automate repetitive tasks like deploying contracts, verifying them on Ethercan, or I don't know generating TypeScript typings for for your contracts. It also compiles your code. Well, of course, it, it manages uh, your dependencies. Like something very particular of Carhat and also Truffle is that they are built on top of Node.js. So uh, right now we don't have a, the, a package system for Ethereum, so we just use npm, and Harhat takes uh, Harhat ensures that it works with Solidity. So you just install your Solidity dependencies with npm as if they were JavaScript, and you can just import them from your contracts. Then it also automates running your tests, and most importantly, it has a testing blockchain. Uh, so let's say that you are working on a on a website, uh, you will use Webpack server or parcel or something like that just to serve your website and be able to test it. Uh, here, if you are uh, like making a smart contract, you need kind of the same, but it's a blockchain. So you need a testing blockchain uh, to run your contracts uh, on. And this was, I think this is pretty confusing for newcomers, but uh, you don't test uh, your contracts on your local machine nor on mainnet you run them on your local testing network. And Harhat's testing network, that's called Harhat Network, is specially focused on debugging. So it has some special features that I'm going to show you. Uh, but let's see how a Harhat project looks like. Uh, is the letter big enough? Can you read? You can make it All a right. little larger. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah, okay. That's good. So as I mentioned, Harhat is built on top of Node.js. So a Harhat project is actually a Node.js project. Uh, and uh, we don't have enough time to show how to initialize it, uh, but you can go to harhat.org slash tutorial, tutorial. Uh, and there you can read how to create the same project. Uh, but as I mentioned, it's just like a normal uh, NPM project. It's just JavaScript. Uh, you have your package JSON that includes Harhat and a bunch of things, your node modules, your contracts, and your test, and your Harhat config where you uh, set up your entire environment. For example, here I'm using the Harhat ethers plugin that automatically initializes uh, ethers to work with Harhat. And Harhat Waffle, which is which adds a lot of you know, handy functionality for testing. Uh, once you have your, uh, and you can also set up things like the version of Solidity you want, and Harhat will automatically download the right compiler. You can also use multiple compilers at the same time. Uh, but that's pretty much all you need to start working on your context. Then you just place them on the context directory. Uh, well, just write your Solidity code. Uh, there's a bunch of interesting things here. The main one is uh, this library called Harhat uh, slash console, uh, which as I told you, this is an, a library, but an NPM library. So it's actually placed somewhere in my node modules, but Harhat will take care of that. You just require it as if it were JavaScript. And this library is very handy because it adds console log capabilities to uh, Solidity, uh, which without Harhat you don't have. Uh, so debugging contracts like this is much easier, pretty much as if you were running a normal language. Uh, and then uh, to test your contracts, you and this is very particular of Ethereum, you normally don't test your contracts in the same language that you write them. Uh, people normally uh, test them using Python, uh, JavaScript or Python. Uh, Harhat is a JavaScript library uh, framework, so you use JavaScript. And they are just normal JavaScript tests. Uh, so we use Mocha here, but you can use our test runners. Mocha is a super popular testing framework for JavaScript. Here we are also using Chai, which is a utility to make tests easier. And as we are using Harhat ethers, 
uh, you are going to get a, an initialized uh, instance of ethers with a bunch of extra functionality. And then you just use ethers to uh, interact with your contacts and check uh, that everything goes as expected. Uh, so here we get a contact factory called Ritter, which is this contract. And we deploy it and get a contract instance. And then use an ethers contract, which uh, Richard explained a few minutes ago, to call the different functions and check that everything went as expected. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Then there are a few maybe uh, caveats here uh, when using uh, ethers and JavaScript with Ethereum uh, that can be confusing to newcomers, but uh, you can use numbers most of the time uh, when dealing with Ethereum amounts in JavaScript because they don't fit uh, in, a, in a JavaScript native number. So you have to use uh, big numbers, which uh, Ethers has. Uh, and this can get a bit uh, different than you would expect because you don't use the typical numbers operators. Uh, but then all you have to do to run this test is to go write npx, which is a launcher for Node applications uh, that already comes uh, built in with Node. Uh, hard hat test. And it's going to run Mocha. And here we can see that all the tests passed. We can see our console logs from the smart contract being printed on our terminal, which is super handy for debugging. Because uh, what has happened like behind the scenes is that Hardhat first created this uh, temporal testing blockchain called Hardhat Network. It always, uh, always gets initialized with the same state. So your tests are deterministic and you can uh, be sure that they are always going to be run in the same way. Uh, and it also uh, prefills some accounts with uh, fake ETH. Uh, so you don't have to uh, care about gas, uh, paying gas uh, for your contracts, your contact deployments, your transactions. You can also test interactions that use ETH. Uh, and then once the tests are run, this temporal blockchain gets destroyed. So if I run them again, uh, a new blockchain is created and destroyed. Uh, so the last thing I want to show you, because it's something pretty handy, is that also Harhat uh, creates uh, solidity stack traces uh, that are very handy for the buying, which it's not common in Ethereum. Like the EVM is a very constrained runtime environment. So things like stack traces don't really exist. And external tooling has to create, recreate them for you. So now if I rerun Hackhat test, the contexts are going to be recompiled. And one of them is going to fail. But here I have a combined JavaScript and Solidity uh, exception, which includes the line where my contact failed. So that's super useful for the buying. And then there's a, there's lots of other things that you can do with Hackhat. Uh, so I just show some useful links, uh, but most of them are in hackhat.org. So you can uh, just get there and browse through the page, but you can follow the tutorial, which is gonna uh, go a bit uh, deeper into what I have just shown. You can also take a look at the plugins. There's a whole bunch of plugins for different things, like automatically verifying your contacts on Etherscan, deploying contracts, uh, generating TypeScript uh, bindings for your contacts. Uh, and then you can uh, join our Discord for support. Uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, thanks for being here. And let's continue with Ronan. Uh, so we had a question in chat. Um, what, okay. are, what are the advantages of using hard hat with type chain? Uh, yeah, so it's the main advantage uh, to me is that uh, well, type chain is for the ones that don't know, type chain is a tool that generates uh, TypeScript uh, typings for your contracts. 
So if you use Haha TypeChain, uh, you can write your test and everything in uh, TypeScript. And that way you avoid uh, silly mistakes like having typos in your uh, tests that take time and are very frustrating. And also you have, you get great autocomplete on your editor and ID, but that's it. I really recommend using it. Uh, and then with Hardhat, how is the blockchain network run? Is it Ganache behind the scenes? Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I get it. No, uh, Hardhat is its own Ganache alternative. Uh, both Ganache and Hardhat are based on Ethereum JSVM, which, are, which is an implementation of uh, the EVM in TypeScript. Uh, but on top of that, both of them build lots of different things uh, to complete the the blockchain. Yeah. Oh, I think Austin, you had a question too. Yeah, there's one in there about um, estimating gas costs too. Did we cover that one? Uh, can we estimate gas costs for a smart contract function on hard hat tests or in a plugin? Uh, in a plugin? Sorry, I, I don't. I didn't get that part. I think I think there's even actually a gas cost plugin for Hard Hat that you can oh, run yes. that will give you like a straight up like performance. Uh, yeah, so there is a Hard Hat uh, gas reporter plugin. Uh, you can take a look at all these plugins in the website, but Hard Hat uh, gas reporter uh, tells you how much gas each test cost. So instead of reporting the time that the test took, which is not very interesting here it tells you, okay, this test consume X number of gas. Got it, okay. I, I'd like to add three little quick things. So first of all, my question about getting started, I think you answered. Basically you have slash tutorial, go to the tutorial. If you wanna yep. feel like you got started, run through that tutorial. Uh, the second thing I'd like to mention is this was previously Biddler. If you've heard of the tool Biddler, yep. Hard Hat was previously uh, Biddler. And then the third thing, oh no, I forgot it. Oh no. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have lists longer than two, I guess. <laughs> oh, mainnet forking. Uh, you guys have recently launched mainnet forking, right? I, I think you may have hinted at it there, but that's a fun yeah. feature that maybe we should kind of just- Yeah, mention. sure. So one pretty common thing uh, when creating smart contracts is having to interact with other smart contracts. Like at the end of the day, that's like the most powerful thing of Ethereum, like being able to compose with different protocols. And testing those uh, uh, contracts that have to interact with other protocols can be pretty hard if you have to set up the entire uh, uh, environment locally with different protocols, deploy all of them, taking them into a realistic state. So we launched a feature uh, which was originally implemented by Ganache that lets you fork mainnet so you get the state of mainnet at a given block and then run a hardhat network starting from there. So you still have fake ETH, fake everything, but the initial state is the same as a mainnet block. And you can do things like impersonating accounts. Uh, like, I don't know, let's say that I'm in, I want to test something on Maker. So I impersonate a Maker contract and I can send transactions uh, as if I were that contract uh, and, I don't know, uh, perform an upgrade on, uh, on Maker or something like that. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, so I think we have Ronan up next. I, I wanna know how to pronounce Wigawag too. What, how do you pronounce your I name? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Same. yeah, uh, yeah. Wig Wigawag. Um, it doesn't, a funny story, I don't know if you can find out by yourself um, typing it, but it's from where I live. Um, I'm sorry, where I, I born uh, in, Fran in Brittany. And it's, um, it's a sound of the, um, the servant of death that come, his chariot makes the sound Wigawag, like, and uh, yeah. That's funny, That's and then it stuck, it stuck with me now. I can't get. But yeah, awesome, awesome. Uh, do you see my screen? Yep. Cool. Um, so, uh, yeah. 
Jo uh, so yeah, I will be presenting Jolly Roger here with um, also in some uh, that deploy that was mentioned, the plugin uh, that jo Jolly Roger dependent uh, that use RDAT. Uh, and so for Jolly Roger, uh, it's basically a template for Ethereum application uh, that include everything uh, to get you started. Uh, it's one command uh, to have the, the environment set up and one command to deploy. And all of it, the goal was to, for me as a Akaton uh, participant, I, over the time I had to fine tune my dev environment and that's basically the result. And I decided to make it public, forcing me to fine tune all these little detail. And so the goal of this template is also to be production ready as much as it can and, and be some fully decentralized. Um, uh, so when I say one command deployment, this also means putting on IPFS. Uh, it's powered by an imprecise tech stack. Basically, I mean, it's relying on all this uh, uh, solution already built. Uh, and so uh, two have been mentioned already are that uh, basically the best in class smart contract development environment. Um, Ethers are really useful like uh, to do a lot of different things and with a lot of little tiny details that matters, like as uh, Rigmo already mentioned. Uh, uh, and are that deploy. So here I will spend a bit more time on it, but basically uh, it adds some things to, to are that. It was originally it was its own framework, but then when are that came, I mean, builder came, um, it was obvious to reuse uh, uh, all, all the interesting thing already there. And what it had is, uh, I mean, the main thing was uh, replicable deployment for tests. So usually when you make a smart contract, you will have to set it up. And then if you make a test, you will have to again set it up. So with other deploy, you do it once. And this is your thing that you will like, uh, deploy, but it's also, and then in the test, you just say, uh, get contract and you pass the name of, of that deployment. And so it, it kind of make it easier uh, to, to do that. Another feature that it has, I think it's the only one uh, that has that in the ecosystem, it's odd contract replacement. So similar to if you're familiar with Webpack and odd module replacement, uh, you can code your contracts. Uh, I mean, for me, it was quite useful. Like uh, I was devel developing a little game using smart contract. And uh, sometimes you are, you are on the front end and you hit an issue, oh, I need to, uh, to be in that state. And the good thing here is that you can just modify your contract, it will auto reload, and then you can reach that state by basically cheating. And the way it works is that it doesn't even let, uh, require you to have, um, to have different uh, uh, bytecodes for mainnet when you want the mainnet one to not be a proxy based. So basically because the way it works is that there is a proxy behind, but it's only in dev environment. And so if you want to launch it on mainnet without a proxy, uh, for immutability purpose, then you can do that as well. Uh, it has exports of front-end development. And an interesting thing that was added recently was the ability to share your deployment procedure. Like, so while art forking, like uh, uh, making the fork, the, the feature of RDAT is very useful in, 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 in most of the case actually, but sometimes uh, you will just want to set up, for example, you, have, you want to set up Uniswap in your Test environment. If Uniswap was using RDAT deploy, uh, they could share the deployment flow, so you could just import the deployment and have it, uh, have it uh, uh, basically up to uh, setup, and so you can run the test against them. Uh, it also has some uh, proxy upgrade management as well included, and there is more features as well. Um, uh, it uses another tech stack that it that Jolly uh, Roger dependent. It's a graph. Uh, this, I think, currently the best in uh, for uh, easy access to smart contract. You can obviously use uh, logs and reading contract, but for some lot for a lot of use case, uh, it doesn't scale very well. Uh, and the graph, because it's open source, uh, you can uh, you can potentially uh, ask user to to run their own node if they want to. Uh, and yeah, as uh, Austin mentioned, like uh, Jolly Roger uses Velt. Uh, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have been interested in Jolly Roger asking for a React version, and, and I'm actually will be really interested if someone uh, uh, was interested in, in doing that. Uh, personally, I like Svelte. Um, it, it has this feeling of you basically write plain HTML, and it adds extra uh, reactive uh, things to it, and it has a low overhead uh, when, when you deploy. 
Uh, and so I'm not sure of the time, I'm trying to go a bit faster. So basically the feature it has, I kind of mentioned, but uh, yeah, it all, everything will reload in Jolly Roger. So the contract, the web front end, and the subgraph. So if you change uh, the, the graph, your subgraph, change the code, up, it will automatically reload. Uh, and you get, um, and the way subgraph work, then they will re-execute everything. So next time you call the, uh, the GraphQL API, you get different results. So all of these give like a great developer experience. Uh, for Arda, for contract, you have Arda for deployment management, Arda deploy, and it uses TypeScript as well uh, by default. Um, and one of the core of it uh, that I, I need to document more is uh, the Web3 library called Web3W. Uh, this one and a lot of interesting things that you are faced when you uh, write uh, front-end development. Uh, so, um, like handling like connection of the wallet, uh, which wallet you can connect to, etc. There is some solution already out there. I decided to to rewrite it uh, because I wanted to be able to do all these little details. So one of them is transaction caching. So you can come back to your web app. It will keep track of the transactions that were pending. Um, keep them. It will also detect if a transaction has been cancelled. And you can even have like notifications that say, oh, that transaction has been cancelled. So you see in MetaMask, you can. Uh, basically create a new transaction to cancel a previous one. And, and all of this with minimal code. So this is an example of um, making a purchase. So let's say you have a contract. Um, of course, there is some other things that are set up behind the scene, but at the end where if you want a button that do a purchase, that's the only code you, you write. And when you click that button, it will detect if you have MetaMask installed, if you have uh, if we, you set up with different wallet, it will show the option. Then when you click the option, it will tell you, okay, now you need to to connect to it or, and then you need to make the transaction. And you see here you know, the contract object is actually a Netter's um, library contract, but it's proxied. So when the call is made, uh, the library will know that uh, there is a transaction pending from, from the user perspective. And then when it's confirmed, it will know automatically. So there is no extra code to add to handle these cases. And as I say, uh, the whole app is production ready. Uh, it's a progressive web app uh, that reach 100% score. I mean, I'm talking obviously of the, the Jolly Roger basic template. Obviously, if you add some stuff, uh, this is not guaranteed. Uh, and the current version have a 50 KB uncompressed uh, first load for the JavaScript. Uh, and the uncompressed is interesting for people who don't really know about uh, IPFS. All the gateways uh, don't compress your HTML. So, it's important to look at the uncompressed uh, value. Uh, and yes, yeah, I mean, actually the, the spend, I think the time I spent the most on building this, I mean, to some extent was the IPFS support uh, because it actually turned out to be tricky uh, in regard to uh, progressive web app. Um, uh, we, so it has nice URL, no hash based URL. Of course, if you need them, uh, you can still use them, but. Um, and it works simultaneously on IPFS URL. So, I mean, um, maybe maybe many of you don't know, but if you can see actually, I think on the ethereum.org website, uh, this doesn't work. Like if you go to the IPFS version, some of the URL broke. And it's because it's actually quite tricky because uh, it basically you need to detect at runtime the base path and do some some kind of work. And I, um, so Jolly Ranger under this kind of thing. Uh, another thing, it, it by default, it sandbox local storage. Uh, so because on the IPFS gateway, uh, every web app uh, are basically sharing the same local storage. So when I say sandbox, it's not secure sandbox. It's just that they are different. So uh, obviously, a malicious app could delete your, your local storage. But if you use it just for basic stuff and not rely on it, uh, you don't have to worry about, oh, I make a new version. Well, actually, in that case, you might want to sandbox in a different way. But uh, so it's just something that you can do uh, with Jolly Roger. And all of this, uh, so all the basically, the template comes with a, a command that will do the contract deployment, the, the subgraph upload, the IPFS spinning, uh, all all in one go. So there's something in Hackathon. You the the world, usually what happens is that you spend your last, your submission time, like spending a lot of time on trying to figure out, oh, I need to do that, does it work? So this uh, allows you to have this set up very quickly. Uh, and this is a way to get it. Uh, it's, yeah, one command you can see on, on, I guess we can send the link later. And 
yeah, I mean, it's how it look. Maybe I can show, I don't know how much time I have. Uh, so yeah, this is how it looks. And so, so that's what I was mentioning. So when you call here, you can set message of the on the contract and behind the scene, it will detect, uh, okay, that now I need to show this, this model. And then when you confirm, and also the UI is, uh, is dynamic. So you will not wait for the transaction to come uh, because you can pass data, the data that you are expecting to be the result. So you will be able to show it before the transaction goes through. Uh, and if it fails, you, you will be able to, to kind of detect that as well. Yeah, so that's, that's basically it. Great. Uh, we had one question in chat. Um, so is browser security thrown out with hosting on IPFS? Uh, which, which kind of security? Uh, browser sure. security? Uh, Juan, do you want to be more specific? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I don't see, I'm not aware of anything except obviously the local storage uh, aspect of it. Juan, uh, but... Juan um, if you want to unmute and just expand on that verbally, that would be good. If, you, if you're able to, if not, just go ahead and type it in the chat. Oh, no mic. Yeah, go ahead, write it, and then we'll relay it. I think one piece to hit on here with the IPFS stuff is when Uniswap uh, got shut down in some countries, right? When when there are certain countries that couldn't access Uniswap anymore, we had the maxis on Twitter shouting about how it wasn't decentralized. But when those apps are deployed to IPFS and anybody can just go to an IPFS endpoint and grab those from some distributed peer, that kind of negates that that effect. And I think that's probably one one little addition addition to add there. Um, I don't know if Juan, you're typing or not. Um, otherwise, Austin, did you have a question in the meantime, your usual question? Of course, of course. Well, I, so so no, knowing uh, sort of what the bread and butter is of Jolly Roger, what what is a good kind of first challenge to get started? H how would you challenge maybe some of the listeners like, go build this with Jolly Roger as, as a kickoff? And, and just to uh, kind of add to that one more, just to lean into something here, we you can tell when a tool is built by a tool maker that's using the tool. And I think we see this here, right? There's a lot of these edge cases that he ran into that he had to build around or build new things for. And you find that in our space, there's, there's a lot of like blind spots that when you start to build something more advanced, you feel, oh man, all this tooling is missing. So out there for all the tool builders, uh, get in on this too. But Back to that, Ronan, what do you, what do you think is like the, the best place to get started, the best way, like the best challenge you could give to- I mean, I have a, yes, yeah, I have a challenge. Maybe it's, maybe it's could, could be it's something I would like to see. Uh, and it's something, another project I've been working on, uh, which is the uh, ERC721, so the NFT subgraph. So I deploy a, a subgraph that will list everything on mainnet, every ERC721 compliant. So a cool thing to build with a template will be basically, at least the first step will be um, a dashboard where you see all the NFT and you can search them. And then the next level would be a marketplace uh, fu fully running on IPFS. Uh, looks like one clarified. Uh, so local storage sandboxing is a browser security feature. Just wondering okay. if there's a way to get that back when using IPFS. Actually, yeah, so actually now uh, the uh, most IPFS gateway now support uh, a domain, so the, the hash as a domain, a subdomain, and this uh, solves the issue of uh, IPFS gateway. But most uh, gateway support both, so you can't rely on how from where the user is coming from, but, and yeah, also it depends on how they, they access it, uh, on if they have an IPFS node locally. Um, but local storage anyway is not uh, safe, like, uh, I, I will not recommend it uh, to use uh, to use it anyway as a as safe uh, as a safe place. Great, thank you for presenting and all the questions and answers. Um, so I think Robin is next. Yeah, hello. Do you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll share my screen. We got it. Oh, nice. So, do you see notes or do you see a presentation now? Presentation. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, okay, yeah. So uh, this is Symphony Hard Hat React. Uh, so we are 
And we are building upon hard hat and ethers and hard hat deploy, which uh, Ronan just presented. So that kind of shows the ex uh, accessibility or composability of the hard hat uh, environment, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, we created this plugin based, uh, in the ethers uh, hackathon, uh, ethers online hackathon. Uh, and they, we just uh, give a quick introduction of uh, us. Uh, so uh, I'm Robin from Symphony in Norway. We are a small company. Uh, we are researching the compo uh, researching if composability uh, in public services in Norway um, is possible. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to find out if we can like build on each other in public services instead of like end-to-end -end integrations. So uh, and. Um, uh, we created this plugin to both use in our own projects, but also to uh, meet uh, meet expectations from uh, Java and C sharp developers, uh, which are uh, who come uh, new to the Web two space. So they are used to uh, working with like uh, very uh, on, in the backend or in front end uh, working with backend. They are used to uh, working with statically typed uh, libraries. So we were we were like trying to give the same experience uh, with this plugin. So. Uh, You've seen uh, this plugin is using Hardhat and Hardhat Deploy and Ethers. So if you're if you're like uh, using that and want to create a front end, uh, I think this is uh, uh, something that we can make your iterations a little bit faster and a little bit uh, easier. So uh, what is Hardhat React? Um, so to start with, we are just a small plugin that you drop into your uh, Hardhat project. Uh, so it requires all these uh, other plugins also. So this can be like your smart contract engine. Um, with those, you can build a full smart contract project. Um, but then many people want to like uh, create a web client to interact with those smart contracts that you are making. Uh, and then suddenly you have to consider, so uh, so when you're in a web client, like how do I get the, the smart contracts I created in Hardhat into the front end? Uh, how do I get the smart contract at this last address I just deployed at? Uh, oh, I need a browser provider. Should I connect to MetaMask? And uh, I know if I need some funds, uh, how, because we have a different account, so how, how do I do that? Uh, so, uh, and like what I created a lot of solidity functions, what, what are their names? So uh, this tech stack uh, help, helps with uh, all of this, like uh, type chain, uh, which are type, type smart contracts. It's TypeScript smart contract. They help with all this, but we just like uh, help them and put it into the uh, into your React uh, uh, React frontend. So the backend process is pretty smooth. Uh, we just wanted to make the front end front end process uh, as quick as possible to iterate. So our goal was to like have one. You can import import one contract, use the function, and assess the response. So and uh, that, so that's that's our goal. And if we can make also the front end code more portable, so we can like swap it uh, between portable projects, like for example a uni Uniswap bundle, that is also pretty cool. So uh, how do we do it? I said this uh, this um, hard hat or back end runtime uh, generates like you're creating solidity files, you're generating. Uh, ABIs, uh, which are uh, which are like, uh, yeah. uh, and then you're generating uh, TypeScript files, which are uh, for like uh, or type chain files, you can call it, which are the typed interfaces for your smart contracts. You have deployments files. Uh, the, the, those explain uh, which uh, where the contract now lives, and you have also the hard config where you set up your network providers. So we just take all of that and. Uh, generate code uh, to make a React uh, context, uh, which you just can use in your front end. So you don't have to, you don't have to think so much about all of this. You can just uh, add the plugin and do this. And then you get the context ready. So, uh, so how, do you, how do you get started? Uh, just like create a hard app project. Uh, so, and, and if in the standard, like, um, yeah. And in the standard hard art project, uh, you get this greeting solidity file. Uh, so uh, you can start with that. Uh, and and uh, you, so you do that and you install the hard hat React uh, plugin, which is a plugin into hard hat. So you just add that in, add it in the, uh, it's the tutorial online. Uh, you can check the NPM, NPM uh, website. 
and then add that in and run mpx hard hat node watch, which is kind of the same thing uh, which uh, Polymus uh, just did. It just starts up uh, the hard hat uh, uh, environment, like the node, the blockchain, uh, which is your local development environment. Um, so it starts up that, and then uh, the watch is from uh, from Ronin's hard hat deploy, which uh, watches every changes you do in your smart contract files. And if you do a change, it uh, redeploys them to your uh, to your local development chain. But and then we hook into that and uh, also do the React uh, generation um, when that happened. So uh, I think actually it's a GIF. Yeah. Do you see the GIF? Yep, it's going. Yeah. Uh, so this is just uh, where it is. Uh, just uh, what you sh are supposed to see. <laughs> Uh, so how so you generate you set up the uh, or the smart contract project then you need to use it um, use it in your front end so uh, and that's we generated this uh, React context file so just import that wrap all the components that needs uh, access to your uh, smart contracts uh, into this uh, and there are also um, there are there are some things going behind the scene here like how do you uh, like loading providers. Uh, like Rick Mo told about, uh, provider signer, uh, we can configure our uh, hard hat product with uh, different providers. So, and we help with uh, like uh, injecting that in correct way and uh, helping you with handling providers and handling signers. Um, so it does all that. It loads the contracts, get, getting you those, those typed uh, interfaces into your TypeScript project. And um, it also does some things for, uh, around handling provider change. So uh, you wrapped your front-end app into this, and now we can like use it in a component. So let's say we are creating a, a greeter component from this greeter, greeter contract. We just import the greeter context, and um, we use that context, and uh, suddenly we have access to uh, at the greeter factory, which we can deploy our contract. We have access to the instance where we can uh, call all the functions. And as you also see here, everything is typed. So like you say, it's show there when we deploy the um, deploy the uh, greeting, it says that oh, it needs a greeting and that needs to be a string. And uh, when we uh, and the result from the the instance dot greet uh, function, it's like oh, you're getting a string back. And that's also nice if you like handling you're working with numbers because uh, oh, it's a big number. And then uh, ethers and type chain takes care of all that. Like oh, it's a big number, and you have these functions to convert it to a string or convert it to a number. So you get all that nice stuff, which is uh, which helps you, and it tells you if you are uh, because it's TypeScript. It tells you if you're wrong. So and also yeah. Um, so and there's also a lot. Of, I think I have to be quick now, but it's also a lot about uh, how we uh, try to uh, help you with uh, getting a development provider and signer up uh, into the front end. Um, so we use WebTree model, uh, which is a great, another great library to be built upon, uh, to, uh, uh, so that you can put in uh, or support many wallets. Uh, and you can also like uh, sh uh, shove in your <laughs> hard hat provider as a HTTP uh, provider. And it will also, you can also like, you see that you have, you can inject. We have added a configuration that like, okay, you can, I, I'm, I know this is unsafe. I want to inject my uh, provider into the front end app. And then you have a browser wallet. So you don't, when you're working with this, you don't have to sign all the transactions in your MetaMask like because you're testing out things. So it can be nice. Uh, it's also the pro pr priority. It can also be used as a fallback uh, kind of thing. So if, if, if the user doesn't have a tree model uh, or a tree model uh, can't find anything, it will like try the next one and push that in as a provider. So that's also nice for like uh, reading. If you don't have a signer, you can just use a provider without a signer and you can read uh, the blockchain and yeah, those things. Uh, yeah, so as I said, it's hooked on deploy. Uh, hard at deploy from Ronin, uh, which is a great library. <laughs> um, and uh, so it's, uh, that triggers when you edit your solid bugs, it regenerates. And then you can, then you, then you also, then we also regenerate our React context, and you get all the updates. So if you like, if you use the function in your front end, and you change it in Solidity file, and then the, the regenerate run, it the front end will now tell you, hey, uh, this function doesn't exist anymore. So please change it. So yeah, uh, 
check out the plugin. Uh, it's in NPM. Uh, you find it on the hard hat uh, or uh, uh, site. Uh, also, if you like, we want to get up really quickly. There's a boilerplate um, which you can use, which is like it's a pre-configured uh, hard hat environment, uh, so nothing special. Uh, yeah, and here's a like, little, 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 very sped up movie of the whole thing. <laughs> you probably got the same thing. Yeah, so that's me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was super informative. Uh, Austin, you have a question? I, I was just going to say, kind of leaning into the fact that this was an ETH global hackathon project, and this was something that was built out of a need that you guys had. Uh, any yeah. advice you would give to up and coming tool builders? Oh, um, uh, tool builders. Uh, I think uh, like Ronin and uh, <laughs> the hard hat guys will be so much better to answer that. But uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of edge cases for everything. So things take more time than you expect. <laughs> that's I think that's my <laughs> that's my uh, yeah. But if for a challenge, like uh, you you challenge everyone, and uh, a fun challenge could be like if you start with the boil break and just throw in your favorite contract like Uniswap or anything else. So maybe some will fail, but uh, you will just get this uh, front end interface. Uh, and you can use it and try to create uh, a React uh, application and use all the functions and everything will be typed so you can just work in the front end. So try that. I can. Uh, I, would, be, I think it would be cool to see some uh, tries on that. Yeah, and then Trent also just posted uh, some info on the next ETH Global Hackathon. Those are really great events and some of the um, like really prominent projects in the Ethereum ecosystem actually came out of ETH Global Hackathon. So make sure to check that out. Um, and then next up, we have Paul. Hey, everyone. Um, can you hear me well? Yep. Yeah, OK, cool. Um, let me show my screen. Uh, I think you have to turn off your screen sharing. Robin's got a hold of it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. All right, um, so I'm building Create ETH app. And um, if you know what Create React app is, this is that, but for Ethereum. Um, so, you know, I could stop there, but that would be a very boring presentation. So uh, let me go on and let me show you like what, like how is Create ETH app different to Create React app and why uh, you want to use this on, on, on Ethereum. Um, so I, I basically combine React with Ethers and DeFi. Um, if you don't know what DeFi is, um, it stands for decentralized finance. And um, we are basically like, I, I'm allowing you to build apps on top of those DeFi protocols um, with one command. And um, I don't have slides, but Create ETH app is very visual. So uh, let me show you the product that you get. Um, after you run the script, you get something like this and it looks basic, but um, in the source code, there are a lot of, of Easter eggs that will guide you in your front end app development process. And as you can see here, you, you, like you've got some basic links that you can um, read about Ethereum, React and, and the graph. Um, the graph being like this data indexing solution that is also plugged into um, what you get with the boilerplate. And we have this nice um, default integration with, with MetaMask that you can use and um, you can disconnect. And, but of course, when I do a demo, it never works. Uh, no, I cannot disconnect. But anyways, normally I could disconnect and then connect again with MetaMask. Um, so we have this by default. And let me go to the source code. Um, there are two things that I want to show you here. First, with this function, um, every time I, I, I show somebody, you know, how you interact with a contract, they're pretty confused about, uh, okay, so what is the contract? How, how do I call it from? And here, Richard's, you know, Ethers is just great because I can do the get default provider uh, trick that he showed before and I can get that provider and that's it. I, I can now interact with, with, with Ethereum and I have this comments here to show you how to do your first contract call ever. So uh, in this case, what I'm doing is that I'm querying a token balance, which is a pretty common um, action that you do in Ethereum, you, you want to know how many tokens, how many ERC20 tokens somebody has. And I'm console logging this so you can see it in the browser um, when you open it. And you know, let me see, yeah, you've got these transfers and there you go. Um, 
oh, oh actually this is something else um i i mistook that for for for, for other feature but for that you have to um make this button show up sorry for that Right, and now we are going to see the on-chain balance, which is using uh, computer units which have 18 decimals. But this is something like 9.9 .9 or something like that tokens. And the other feature that you get um, at the beginning is an integration with, with a subgraph. And all DeFi protocols have a subgraph, and this is a very useful um, platform that indexes all Ethereum events and make them available via this GraphQL API. And GraphQL is just amazing. And it's super slick to use, super, super easy. And I have this React hook here that just logs in some token transfers. And yeah, you can start from here and build whatever you want. Uh, many people have been using this for various uh, reasons. People build personal apps for their own social money token. And even ENS used this to power one of their um, UI apps. So that was pretty fun to see. Finally, um, I wanted to show you two more features that you get with this. Um, it's not just about like one default template. Um, we actually have quite a few um, DeFi templates that you can choose from. And I don't have time to go into all of them. But um, if you want to say, you know, build a UI for Aave, or Compound or Uniswap, um, you can do the following command. So you would do yar, yarn create eth app. Um, you, would, you would name your app something like my of app, right? And you would do dash dash template of it. And there you go. Now you have all the bad, all the goodies that I showed you um, in the source code, plus the other contracts, the ABIs, and the addresses on mainnet. So this is pretty handy. Um, and finally, this is not just React, um, it's also available as a view, uh, Vue.js um, uh, alternative. So if you were to do yarn create edap um, and you would use my view, you do dash dash framework, then you'd have the same good as but for view. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of optionality that, that you can choose from when you're building an app with with create eth app and yeah um my my last remark is that this is only for front-end development um uh, if you, if you want smart contract development there are many you know tools available for that and hard hat is is also my my preferred one uh, so you can use that this is only for for front-end development so um i guess that was it happy to answer any questions if any very cool uh austin you have a question <laughs> Uh, let's see. So the, the, the fact that you bring in Aave like that, I'm assuming that not just the ABI and the address is there, but you probably get some really handy, like function name completers. Like you can type, you know, whatever the function is dot and then start typing balance and it'll just auto complete balance of for you. Do you, do you get some of that, that magic with, with create ETH app? Uh, no, unfortunately not, but, um, I, I think to get that you need TypeScript. This is only for, with JavaScript for the moment. So you get like a JavaScript app, just like Create a React app does. Um, but what you also get with, with all these DeFi templates is, so the contract APIs, the addresses, and you also get like the libraries, the official libraries that Aave you know, or, or Uniswap or um, whatever they, they, they publish to NPM, they're all combined. So you can easily you know, tap into that tool and, and see what they offer you. That's right. It's not just a contract address and an ABI. There's there's these libraries that have to come in, and there's there's a fair amount of work that it takes to integrate within a, in each of these uh, uh, protocols. And you've done that. That's awesome. I didn't realize you were over on the JavaScript side with me. I thought you were on the TypeScript side. The source code is in TypeScript, so I'm coding this with TypeScript. But uh, for the end user, they only get JavaScript for now. Awesome. Uh, and then last up is Austin. Hey, all right. I think we got a little bit of time. I'll probably speed run through mine also. Let me let me share a desktop and slide over here. Okay, so this is, let me just start it off with, if you just Google Scaffold ETH, you'll land here and it'll take you to the repo. But Scaffold ETH is, is everything you need to, to get started building decentralized applications powered by smart contracts. So I, I brought in Hardhat, uh, Ethers, Web3 Connect, 
uh, notify from block native, the graph, so many more things. And, and my goal here was to just create something that you can grab out of the box and, and basically prototype Web3 applications. And what I mean by that is sort of play around with your smart contracts and your solidity at the same time you're playing around with your UI, sort of wire up a function and then wire up the button to call that function and see how it works. And it kind of helps you kind of inform how you write your solidity. So let me, let's see. So basically, yeah, you, you clone it down, you CDN, you yarn install, uh, then you yarn start and you get your React dev server. Uh, you yarn chain and you get your hard hat node and then you yarn deploy and your contract is compiled. The artifacts are uh, injected into your front end and you get like a nice hot reload over here uh, with, with your contract. And there's kind of some, some scaffolding at first, but then it teaches you through kind of uh, how, how you would build out a UI, how you would parse events, how you would build those buttons in the front end. And then eventually when you get kind of tired of using uh, event listeners, you can uh, kind of upgrade to, to the graph with, within scaffoldy. Let me just do a quick example here. Uh, uh, oh, uh, there we go. I think I had some code. There we go. I'm going to fake writing some code here just by Un undoing, but I'm just adding a counter in here, something really simple that you would do. And I do this like on every demonstration, but basically if I want to, uh, I, I do a lot of mentorship sessions. So I'll, if, if side chill, if, if you are a great developer looking to get into Ethereum, uh, check out ETH build for uh, the, the fundamentals and check out Scaffold ETH for building an app and all of these other uh, wonderful tools that we've seen here today. But you can hit me up one-on-one -on -one for a one-on-one -on -one dev session. Also, I'm, I'm open to doing one-on-one -on -one dev sessions if you're a good developer looking in to get into to Ethereum. But here we go. So, so I'm going to just write a quick little counter here. Very, very simple, but it helps to show how uh, you can iterate on this. So, so I've just added a counter variable and I've added a function to decrement the counter. And, and what this is going to do is we see this kind of auto adapt to that. And then I can hit, oh, I don't have any gas. Okay. I got to rewind a little bit. So when you land on a, a scaffold ETH app, it's going to auto generate a burner wallet for you. And you can take that burner wallet down to the faucet, get some funds. Now I should be able to decrement my counter. And what I want to show here is that you can kind of test your assumptions. What's this going to do? When I subtract one from zero of a uint eight, that's going to give us 255, right? And if I wanted to uh, basically kind of test my assumption of what's the biggest number we could roll under into, uh, we could just change that to a 256 and run one line. And now when I decrement that, we get uh, that number, basically the largest number you can track with with 256 bits. So, so Scaffold ETH lets you get into this mode where you're you're kind of like, I don't know, maybe I want an address owner, and uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet. But you, you kind of like write in your solidity. You do this deployment, and you can also have this thing watching. But then in the in on this side, you start to get uh, uh, some some interface with that contract. So. Um, the let's see builder example okay cool let's let's do let's just set the purpose to hello world so our contract is just some arbitrary string and we have some set purpose but i wanted to show off this to give the hard hat guys props there's a nice console log right there in my solidity so when i come over here and i write hello world and i hit send there we go. Look at this. We've got a beautiful console log right there in our console that lets us know, gives us feedback on what's going on. And that's one of the superpowers of having hard hat is you get that introspection into the EVM and they, they kind of tell you what's going on. And if you can't figure out what the heck is going on, why when I take five divided by two, do I get that answer? You can throw a console log in here and really get, get some information about what's going on there. Okay, let's see, how are we doing on that? We, we are closing quickly. Uh, so so Scaffold ETH is meant to be kind of this hackathon stack. I, I found myself hacking at ETH Denver 2018, hacking, hacking at all sorts of different hackathons. The first 
you know, a good portion of the time was spent just setting up my environment and getting it ready. So the point of Scaffold ETH was to be like, okay, you can clone this thing and you can have all of these components that I found myself. For, for instance, this address display, right? It's got a nice little copy next to it. This this wallet, or how about this, this balance here? I can click this balance and switch between ETH and uh, uh, USD. Or I can open up my wallet and type austingriffith.eth and I get that nice uh, blocky preview you right or oh, oh there it goes or i i can whoa i can uh have my scanner set up so if i had a qr code or i could put in like a hundred dollars here and i can swap between usd or swap the view between usd and eth right all these little components that i found myself building at all these hackathons i've put into scaffold eth and then if we kind of dig into that a little bit further, there's there's example UI too. So you compile and you deploy your contract and then it injects it into a React app. And within that React app, there are, let's see, here we go. We, we've we've talked about providers from, from Rickmu and, and Ethers. We've got our main net provider getting ENS for us. And then we have our local provider that's getting our contracts. But then there's all these tasty hooks here that will help you get up to speed quicker. So I have like a use balance, right? A use balance hook, you just throw in the provider and the address and it's gonna track that balance for you in your React state. Uh, a little gotcha there is that balance is not gonna be a float value. That's one of the things that you have to get over at first. That that balance is going to be a big number and you have to use format ethers to display that. But that's gonna save you some time because when you start doing math in JavaScript, it's not fun. But if you use the, the big number library to do your math, Rick move will, will handle it a little bit better for you. And then there's kind of read contracts. We, we bring in Web3 modal so you can connect your MetaMask if you'd like. Um, there's that contract scaffolding there, the hints, the UI. Uh, let's just dive into that example UI. So here's a really cool hook, just use contract reader, right? So given my contract name and the variable I want, it's basically keeping this purpose tracked for me in my React state, and I see it right there. And then uh, uh, just typical like React tracking the state, I've got this controlled component here and then a button that will that will uh, give me that transaction and, and set the purpose to hey, hey, hey. Uh, this is a cool hook for tracking events. There's use event listener. You basically give it your contract name, you give it the event you'd like to listen to and it's just gonna keep uh, an array of those objects for you. And then you can just throw that into a list down here and you're going to get that list of events. So I think I kind of hinted at it earlier, but once you get tired of parsing those events, there's always the subgraph and here, here are the uh, instructions for using that. Um, I, I try to take care of as much for you as I can. I try to, there's there's things like I include my Infura key and and shout out to, to Rickmu. Uh, when I talked to Infura about getting this kind of setup, they called it the Rickmu plan. But basically my my Infura key is distributed with Infura, with Scaffold ETH. So when, when you first get in, it's gonna do all those ENS polls to mainnet. It's gonna use Infura, but it'll, it'll die on you quickly. But I wanted to get you to the point where you have this kind of, you've got your contract, you're making changes, you've got your front end, you're poking at it, you're learning how it's going to work and, and kind of doing that, uh, shout out to Robin, doing that in symphony, right? Like kind of doing that in parallel. And, and you learn a lot by doing that. So first mentorship session, we basically just jam through this. I send them home to build a decentralized bank using mappings and learn some more of the primitive data types. Uh, we come back and we deploy to a public network. Uh, using hard hat um, and then and then it gets like weirder right we start talking about building a multi-sig how does call data work uh, once once you've got that down can we do contract to contract interaction inheritance factories proxies all that stuff is kind of part of the curriculum and I'm kind of building it up so uh, yeah hit hit up scaffold ETH check it out uh, always open to feedback always open to collaborators um, Thank you, thank you, thank you to uh, Trent and Linda for giving us this platform and ETH Global. Uh, this, this has been awesome today to see all these tools from all these tool builders and hopefully uh, get you the developer started and get you confident with, with building decentralized applications. I think it might be good to just kind of open it up to kind of like the last five minutes of just random questions or, or anything else. One, one thing that I, I would like to ask is, 
TypeScript versus JavaScript. It sounds like, Paul, you use TypeScript to build your tools, but your tools end up being in JavaScript. I think a lot of the tools that we've seen today are using TypeScript. Am I a noob? Like, dunk on me here. Is my it, 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 using JavaScript? Is that is that uh, the right way to go or not? What do you guys think? Well, um, I think I can answer that. Um, I think for like long-term projects, especially when writing tests for contracts, go for TypeScript because you don't want to end up like into false positives modes where your tests pass, but because the variable is a string, not a number, right? Um, but you know, for all the short-term projects like hackathons, just use JavaScript. Like there, there's a huge ecosystem around this language. You know, a lot of tools give you this. Um, just hack through uh, the weekend and use that. But for long-term projects, use JavaScript. That is my my thinking, and uh, it's been working well for me. <laughs> I'm actually going to jump in. I'm going to kind of go against what you just said. Um, sorry about that. I mean, so don't, don't get me wrong, I hate TypeScript. Like it's absolutely terrible, but it's a wonderful tool. Um, it's a lot better now than it was when I first started using it. I think basically for me, once I've been using it for more than an hour, once I've wrote, written anything for more than an hour, it starts really paying off. Like that first, that first like hour and a half in when you need to do a, like a refactor and you change that one variable name, getting a list of the eight places where you forgot to change it like right away saves you so much time because otherwise you run it and it works fine for a while until two hours later when you find a hunk of code you didn't update. Um, it certainly takes an extra like 10 minutes to set up and basically all I ever do is copy like the TS config from ethers into a new project and start from there. Um, but especially for something like Ethereum, there's it's so easy to make a mistake that costs real world money. Even if it's just like test net money, it's still real world enough that, yeah. Anyways, there's a ton, I, I'm, 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 like I said, I'm mixed, right? Cause I really, really hate it, but it is so useful. That's where, so for that's, me, it's just like the learning curve was just a little bit too much. And I kind of went up that a couple of times. And when I'm thinking of new developers getting into the space, I maybe don't want them going through that. But if everyone dunked on me hard for TypeScript, I was going to switch anyways. I'm kind of in the middle now. One, one shout out I don't think we've made yet is ethereum.org. If, if you want to get started, go to ethereum.org. There's a ton of tools, ethereum.org slash developers. There's a ton of tools there. I see Chris in the chat with, with Reach. There's a lot of other tool builders and tools out there. Uh, just keep keep your head up, pay attention. Don't go, don't go into the dark and build something like I did for, for, for months and months and months without asking anybody because it's probably not going to hit, right? Like s develop in public, show off your stuff, get feedback, put it in people's hands, let us play with it. That I think that's going to lead you to building a better product in the space. Uh, two quick questions. Uh, can I use scaffold ETH locally from Kev? Yep. Yeah. This is all local uh, on my machine, right? Like you, you've got your local dev server, you've got hard hat, and then uh, you're, you're just deploying locally at first. But then what you do is you change that default network in your hard hat config and kind of point, point your contract deploying satellite up to your public network. And then you point your app satellite at, at whatever network that is and deploy your apps. So you kind of deploy your contracts and deploy your apps to a public network eventually, but at first it all works locally. Cool. And then what's the best way for people to connect for dev sessions with you, Austin? Uh, DM, slide into the DMs. I'm at Austin Griffith on Twitter and Telegram and everything else. Awesome. Thank you. So we're pretty much coming up at the time. I uh, really appreciate all the speakers uh, for presenting today. Uh, you should follow all of them on Twitter. Um, there's also the Telegram group you can join if you want to connect with other devs. Maybe you can build something together at the upcoming ETH Global Hackathon. Uh, and this is recorded again, so feel free to refer to it later if you need to catch up on something else. Um, yeah, and then thank you, Trent, so much for uh, organizing this and uh, really hope you guys uh, build in the Ethereum ecosystem. And uh, we'll also host another onboarding session in a few months too, I'm sure. So you can check that one out as well. And Trent, if you had other stuff you want to yeah, add. Yeah, just, just to wrap really quick. Um, the it's pretty clear that these sessions are really useful for people. So we will continue doing them and seeing updates from the projects like we've seen present here, just to get you know a consistently updated view of what the ecosystem is and where it's going. 
Um, so probably starting in January, we'll, we'll be looking towards the next one. Uh, and like Linda mentioned earlier, and I relayed in the chat, uh, one of the best ways, as you saw with Symphony, to build something is at a hackathon. So I would strongly encourage everybody to apply. You can apply by yourself or bring a team um, to the next ETH, on, uh, ETH Global Hackathon uh, that starts in January, um, mid-January, I believe. And the first round of applications closes on the 31st of December. So um, if you're new or you've been around for a little bit, I highly recommend this one is we're partnering with Aave. So if you if you know Aave or if you've heard of DeFi, this is a great way to dip your toes into both Ethereum development and then learning about DeFi itself. Um, and then the last thing I will say is that if you haven't heard of ETH Global, um, like I mentioned, we run hackathons. Typically, it was in the past we did in-person events, but all of 2020 we've done um, online events only. And so we're continuing to do that, um, at least while the pandemic is still going on. So we'd love to have you join us. Um, we also have a small-ish but growing developer community uh, in our Discord. So you can also check that out as well. Um, any final comments or shout outs that the, the presenters want to make? Um, and then we can just wrap there. Thank you so much. This, is, this has been really awesome. I just want to say happy Bowtie Friday, all the builders. Hearts, hearts, of hearts. Of course. Great. Thank you again, everybody. Linda, that was perfect. Everybody for sharing the stuff that they've built. This is a really awesome experience just to sit back and watch everything happen. We will see everybody on the internet, on Twitter, Bye. maybe in the Discord or Telegram. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.